Hello and welcome to Education and Training. The following podcast has been designed to support your understanding of the Defence Syllabus. This podcast is about the international system. The ring depicts the international system. States engage with one another in an environment known as the international system. All states are considered to be sovereign and some states are more powerful than others. The system has a number of informal rules about how things should be done, but these rules are not binding. The modern international system under which we live today is only a few centuries old. So let's look at the significant events that have marked the milestones in the development of the international system. Let's start to populate our system. Here we have a state, and this state is our United Kingdom, with a government population, a border, monopoly on force, sovereignty and recognition by other states. If you would like to know more about these characteristics, then please view the podcast on the state. So far, we have a state and the international system, but where did this concept come from? There was an event a few hundred years ago in 1648 called the Peace of Westphalia which ended the 30-year war between Catholic and Protestant states in Europe. It declared that the sovereign leaders of each nation-state could now do as they wished within the state's borders and established the state as the main actor in global politics. From that point forward, the international system has consisted primarily of relations amongst these states. The reason this was needed was because religious conflict had caused turmoil in Europe. An age of non-professional armies sucked the land of all the resources, economies broke down and life was pretty miserable. So the monarchs got together and decided a new way forward was required based on sovereignty. An analogy that might help you understand this is imagine you were going to a family barbecue and you were head of the family called England. And whilst you were at that barbecue, other members there, possibly heads of family or the children there, were encouraging your children to do things you didn't agree with, like drink underage, for example. Then at this barbecue, there would probably be conflict because you as the head of family would think that it was inappropriate for other families to be interfering with what you believe is appropriate for your family. This same thing was happening in Europe in the 17th century, where monarchs and people were interfering across borders in terms of what religious connotation people were from. Now after this turmoil, the heads of the family had decided that nobody should interfere with how they think things should be done within their borders. Just as you would say at this family barbecue, nobody should tell me how to bring up my children. It's my right as the head of the family to decide that. Now let's look at what the international system looked like after the Peace of Westphalia. Well, we now have several powerful states. And at this stage in the international system, the only actors were really the powerful states. They were known as the great powers. There is a problem with this system. The problem is one of anarchy. The system is known as anarchic, which means there is no central authority. The word anarchy in Greek simply means leaderless, no central authority, or international police force which can enforce certain behaviours. Each state can in fact do whatever their power allows them to do. Although the UN exists to influence these interactions, actors operate in a way that they see fit in support of their national interests. For example, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in the 1990s. It was against the established international law, but that still didn't prevent Saddam Hussein, who thought he had much more power than Kuwait, from invading them. So, in order to deal with this problem of anarchy, 
the international system has had to resort to something called the balance of power. The concept of the balance of power is that if powers are equal, then that will avoid conflict as no one power has the certainty of victory. Following the Peace of Westphalia, a series of powerful states dominated Europe, with the great powers rising and falling. Weaker states often banded together to prevent dominant powers from becoming too strong, a practice known as preserving the balance of power. Frequent wars and economic competition marked this era. Some nations, like France and Great Britain, grew in power, whereas other nations, like Spain and the Ottoman Empire, shrank in power. A way to help us understand how the balance of power works is by looking at something called the chandelier model. Let's go back to our international system. And you can see that the, the UK is in the centre and that would act as if it was the arm of a chandelier that would be attached to the ceiling. And we're looking at this through a cross section. Now state A, B and C are the arms of this chandelier. And providing these arms are of equal weight and strength, then the chandelier will remain balanced. However, if one of these arms was to grow in strength and power, then the balance of power of the chandelier would be affected in some way. There wouldn't be equilibrium. It would lead to conflict. State A has innocently armed itself because it has found a new resource that it wants to protect. State B and C are suspicious of State A's actions and therefore arm themselves in order to protect themselves. State A sees this and feels that it needs to increase its defences and arms itself further, leading to State B and State C doing the same. This has happened in reality over the period of the last few centuries and it's known as a security dilemma. Because by attempting to make the international system or each state attempting to make themselves feel secure, what they have inadvertently done is created insecurity because there are now more means within the international system of conflict. If we go back to the map of Europe and we can see that when these states were established Germany and Italy were very fragmented. Well, in the late 19th century, Germany and Italy unified. This created a new security dilemma, where Germany and Italy, both states that viewed themselves as coming late to colonial expansionism, Germany wanted to expand and have overseas assets just as France and Great Britain did. They were starting to build a navy that could rival Great Britain's navy and they also had significant land forces. So this led to an arms race between the European states, eventually culminating in the conflict we all know as the First World War. In the aftermath of the war, the international system changed dramatically. The major powers of Europe had suffered greatly. Therefore, the League of Nations was created in an attempt to bring all the states and powers of the world together so that decisions could be made diplomatically. However, the system didn't work, which led to the outbreak of the Second World War. The international system expanded again at the end of the Second World War. There was a notion that people of national identities within the world had the right to self-determination and that the bigger powers like Great Britain and France for example should give up their colonial possessions and give states the right to independence. India is a, a good example of one of these where a medium power who became a player on the international stage. Well, following those events and further down the line, more states were given power and you had lots of 
lesser powerful states. So you can see the international system is starting to become much more complicated from when it began at the end of the Peace of Westphalia. What we also have to consider today are non-governmental organisations. These are organisations that do not belong to any state but operate within the international system. The Red Cross, for example, or Amnesty International. We have multinational corporations like Google that have headquarters in more than one state that are quite rich and powerful and can play a significant part within states, specifically states that do not have a large economy. We also have organisations such as the World Bank, which promotes long-term economic development and attempts to reduce poverty by providing financial to support to help countries with specific projects such as building schools, health centres, providing water, electricity, fighting disease and protecting the environment. This notion was created at the Bretton Woods Conference at the end of the Second World War to try and make the world a much fairer place so that the smaller states within the international system could work themselves out of poverty. We also have the International Monetary Fund which promotes international monetary cooperation and tries to make it fair for exchange rates. It also provides loans to states that may be struggling in terms of paying back their debts. The most significant organisation that was created is the United Nations, which is an intergovernmental organisation which is there to promote international cooperation. It was a replacement for the ineffective League of Nations. And the main or the central mission for the United Nations is the maintenance of international peace and security. If you would like to know more about the United Nations and its main organs, then please view the United Nations podcast. Today's world also has to consider radicals or extremists who also operate on a global scale. This is mainly due to them opposing globalization and that we call this the backlash to globalization, whereas these radicals and extremists do not want their culture to be assimilated by Western culture, which is seen as the dominant culture within the globe at present. New World Orders The end of World War II marked a decisive shift in the global system. After the war, only two great powers remained, the United States and the Soviet Union. Although some other important states existed, almost all states were understood within the context of their relations with these two superpowers. This global system is called a bipolar system. The orders we have are the first, second and third world. The first world is considered to be the states that industrialized first and associate themselves with Western democratic culture. And they're the states that are in dark blue and light blue. The second world is the area of the globe that industrialized second and are associated with Russia and, or socialist states. And they're the ones in dark red and light red. And then we have the third world order, which are the states in green. You associate the third world with poverty or dilapidated states. However, it just simply meant that these states were not aligned to first or second world, probably because they didn't have enough to offer. Then we have the non-aligned states. These are states who may have consciously objected to align themselves to either the first or second world, but may have a significant amount of power and could have. India, for example, which is a nuclear power now and with a significant population, was in the non-aligned movement following the Second World War. Whereas today, you would probably consider India to be within the First World Order as it is the largest democratic state on the planet. There are two main political theories that we need to understand. 
they are liberalism and realism. Realism has been the dominant political thought in international relations. Realists base their argument on the theories of traditional realists such as Thomas Hobbes and Edward Carr, who all advocate the political doctrine of raison d'etat, or reason of the state. Realists believe that human nature is self-centred and competitive, and therefore protecting self-interest is of utmost importance in order to survive. Realism is centred upon four main propositions. The first we have discussed, anarchy, which is that international system is anarchic and that no actors above states exist, therefore states must regulate their own interactions as the international system is in a constant state of antagonism. Therefore, states must also respect each other's sovereignty. The second proposition, egoism, is that states make rational and intelligent decisions in pursuit of their own selfish interests. The third proposition, groupism, is that states are the most important actors and power is referred to as a system of polarity. We can see from the New World Order that it is a bipolar world with only two superpowers, the US and Russia, and all of the other states have a choice between either of these larger powers. If we go back to the Peace of Westphalia, there were several powers that was known as a multipolar world. Well, some would argue that today is a unipower world, with the US being the only dominant superpower. Others would argue that a new multipolar world is emerging, as states such as India and Brazil, nuclear power and large economies are emerging that could challenge the US authority. States like China and the European Union that can also challenge the authority of a unipolar world. The fourth proposition is power politics, which is based on the state's primary concern of its own survival through the use of force. Realists also argue that their philosophy is based on the real situation, and they accuse liberalists of basing their approach on the way it should be. Liberalism is a political thought which considers the relationship between the government and the population. Traditional liberalists were John Locke and Immanuel Kant, who challenged realist thinking and proposed that government should be based on ideas such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, free markets, democratic societies, secular governments and international cooperation. Locke argued that each man has a natural right to life, liberty and property, while adding that governments must not violate these rights based on the social contract. What he was arguing is that the government has a contract with the people. This social contract is that they have a duty to provide these rights for its citizens. If the government is failing to do that, then what liberalists believe is that this government should not then be recognised by other governments. It does not have sovereignty or monopoly on force for the people within that state. Now this is a, an important concept to understand as it divides this bipolar world that we can see. We, the Western liberal states, believe that if a corrupt government is not doing its job properly, that we can intervene in order to protect the majority of the people of that state. Whereas the realists still believe in the principle of sovereignty. They remember the events of the Peace of Westphalia and they remember the chaos that could have been created at that family barbecue. And if we do not respect each other's sovereignty and we start intervening in what other governments are doing, then it will only lead to conflict. So therefore, it doesn't matter what the government is doing, realists say that you should not get involved. A good example of this at the moment is Syria, where we, the West, probably accuse Assad 
of not being fair to his people and breaking this social contract, therefore giving us the right to intervene and protect the people, whereas the realist states believe that the most important aspect here to protect the international system is to support the government of Syria in creating a stable state. Liberalists also believe that war is an outmoded method of settling disputes between states and that liberal democracy could create perpetual peace. Liberals believe that the international institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF and the United Nations play a key role in the cooperation among states. That the balance of power system does not work and the world is increasingly interdependent and interconnected. Let's go back to the international system to see what interdependence means. As we can see, the international system is already looking much more complicated than it did at its creation, the Peace of Westphalia. But liberalists also believe that there are connections between all of the states of the international system and all of the organisations, and they all have an effect on each other therefore being interconnected and interdependent. For example, if there was a market crash in the United States and their economy dipped, then that would have an effect on most of the states within the international system. We also refer to this phenomena as globalization. Globalization is a term describing the phenomena of human society becoming interdependent and interconnected. This phenomena can be examined through what is called the three waves of globalization. The first wave was the age of discovery in the 14th century. The second wave was the time of the European empires in the 18th to the 20th century. And the third wave is from the end of the Second World War to the present day as a new epoch in human affairs emerges. These periods have all seen human society become more interconnected and interdependent, leading to an assimilation of one society by the more dominant society. Human society is arguably progressing towards sharing the same social space on a global scale. This is due to an advancement of technology in communication and travel. Long distances are now breached in a fraction of the time, allowing people to travel more freely, spreading ideas and culture, which builds societies that are more interconnected. Communication is now instant from one side of the globe to another, making commerce and interchange between societies much easier. Some argue that globalization is bringing human society closer together, whilst others point out the tensions and conflict that is created as a result of globalization. For example, some of the smaller states within the international system can be taken advantage of by the more powerful states with their improved connections throughout the globe. In summary, in order to understand the international system properly, you need to understand the political theories of realism and liberalism. Realists do have a point that the system is anarchic and it's based on sovereignty. And if we respect each other's sovereignty and do not intervene with what each state is doing, then there is a good chance we can avoid conflict. However, the liberalists recognize that despite respecting each other's sovereignty, the world has become interconnected and interdependent. And what happens in one state can affect all the states within the international system. And therefore, this presents an argument of whether the state system that was created at the end of the Peace of Westphalia is now due for an overhaul. That possibly we need a new system, one with a world government, a real central authority that can enforce behaviours. I leave that for you to decide and hopefully it will raise some interesting discussions on CLM. Well, that's the international system. If you've enjoyed this workshop, then please visit 
education and training for more options. And thank you for visiting.